Ahead of Antony Blinken's visit to Israel today, DW Washington Bureau Chief Enos Pohl talked to Nathan Trek, deputy spokesman at the U.S. Department of State, about the United States plans to press for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war. Nathan Tech, thank you so much for making time for Deutsche Welle. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So uh, the U.S. administration is seeking a pause in the fighting between Israel and Hamas. Uh, how can the U.S. government influence Prime Minister Netanyahu, who doesn't seem to slow down? Well, just to clarify, what we're looking for is not just a single pause, but rather pauses. And in fact, as my colleague Matt Miller, the department spokesperson, has noted before, we have seen, in effect, de facto pauses in the past uh, to ensure, for example, that humanitarian aid can enter in via truck through the Rafah gate uh, into Gaza. And at the same time, we've seen pauses to ensure that American hostages uh, can get released and leave Gaza as well. So our goal when we say humanitarian pause is to ensure that military operations do not interfere with with the delivery of humanitarian assistance to the civilians who need it, uh, do not interfere with the, the with the release of hostages or with the exit of foreign nationals stuck in Gaza who are just trying to go home. Mm. So, is Prime Minister Netanyahu kind of listening to the wishes of the U.S. government? Well, uh, look, uh, at the end of the day, we enjoy a very strong relationship with Israel, and that strong relationship allows us to be in a position to offer our Israeli friends advice and the best practices of our own experience in fighting terrorism. And that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we are making clear to the Israelis that uh, as democracies, we have a responsibility to do take every measure to ensure that uh, hu uh, human life is preserved, civilian life is preserved, that the international uh, uh, humanitarian law is respected and protected. Unfortunately, by the way, it's just important to note that Hamas, of course, has shown no regard for international humanitarian law. So the burden, burden is not solely on Israel here, right? Mm. It's, in fact, important to note uh, that Israel is responding to a despicable, brutal terrorist attack that took place on October 7th. No country, no sovereign country would accept, would accept or do nothing in the face of that kind of an attack. And Israel is simply exercising the right it has and the obligation it has to defend itself. The Arab Muslim community here uh, in the United States is raising concerns. Uh, frustration um, about uh, President Biden being in such strong support of Prime Minister Netanyahu and some are saying no we won't vote uh, for him again next year. What does that mean for the president? Well, uh, we don't do politics here at the State Department, uh, but there's certainly no question. As I said before, the United States is a diverse and vibrant democracy. People have a wide range of views, and they exercise those views at the ballot box. Uh, I think what's important also to note is that, of course, we have lots of friends and partners in the Arab world and the Muslim world overseas. Uh, we've engaged in robust, almost daily conversations with our partners in the Arab world about this issue, uh, and we're grateful for those relationships that we have, and we're going to continue to work with uh, allies and partners uh, including countries like Egypt, Jordan, Qatar, uh, and others uh, to ensure that we can protect Palestinian civilians and ensure that Israel ha maintains its right to exist and defend itself. Secretary of State Blinken is uh, right now traveling in this region. How big is the fear that the conflict spreads and might also bring terrorism back to the United States? Well, our goal, of course, is to stop this conflict from spiraling, from spreading. Uh, Hamas is doing everything it can to pull in other uh, regional uh, countries to uh, destabilize the entire Middle East. Uh, we, of course, firmly oppose that. And part of the reason why this is the Secretary's, I believe, third trip in just a matter of a few weeks to the region is because he is so firmly committed to doing everything we can, using the tools of diplomacy to ensure that this conflict does not spread throughout the region. What does this conflict in Israel mean for the conflict for the war? in Ukraine. Well, uh, as we like to say in the United States, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can do two things at the same time. We're are a great nation, and we've got great partnerships and alliances around the world as well. Uh, the United States will continue to provide Ukraine with what it needs to do, what it takes to defend itself from Russia's brutal, unprovoked, uh, and illegal uh, further invasion. Uh, our goal continues to be to provide Ukraine with, with what it needs militarily, diplomatically, and economically uh, to ensure that it can defend its own sovereignty. We have not forgotten Ukraine. Ukraine is still at the top of the agenda. And even with the new speaker in the House, who kind of uh, is saying pretty much the opposite from what you are saying, what would be your message to Ukrainians? Can Ukrainians rely 
on the United States. Uh, the Ukrainians can absolutely rely on the United States. President Biden has made that clear. Secretary Blinken has made that clear. Uh, and uh, he, the uh, Ukraine can also appreciate the fact that we built a very strong set of alliances, uh, strengthened NATO like it's never been strengthened before, uh, and, uh, and a broad coalition of countries, of over 50 countries, in fact, who are working to provide Ukraine with what it needs to defend its sovereignty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's now speak to journalist uh, Karim El Gohari, who is in Cairo. Uh, Karim, uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Blinken is in Israel to press for humanitarian pauses in Gaza. What would those pauses mean for the transit at the Rafah border? Of course, uh, uh, pauses or a pause, as uh, the Arab world is demanding, it uh, would make a big difference because. Uh, it is very difficult to move within the Gaza Strip right now um, towards, for example, the Rafah border. And uh, it would make it much easier to get humanitarian aid in and uh, injured people out, as it's happening now, but in small numbers. For example, we had like uh, roughly a bit more than 500 trucks since the beginning coming into the Gaza Strip. That was the amount of trucks that was before the war needed every day in mm. Gaza. We understand uh, you met with some people who've managed to leave the Gaza Strip. What have they told you? Yeah, it's a group of uh, Austrians uh, who were evacuated from the Gaza Strip uh, uh, two days ago, and I managed to talk to them. It, they told me basically like how difficult it was to coordinate this whole evacuation within the Gaza Strip, with the communication often down, with often having no electricity, having no internet. So that was the first big challenge. They, talked about the relief uh, when they came out, walked through this gate in Rafa, coming out with their family in safety, but at the same time saying, OK, we left all our old life behind. And then they were talking about the situation in Gaza. He was telling me, for example, the story that he, with his family, every night there is no shelter or nothing when the bombardments are on. And he said they were basically lying all here. It's his daughter, six and nine years old, and the family were lying in one bed with the argument when the house is bombed, then we are dying altogether or we're surviving altogether. That's the strategies of people in Gaza right now. Oh, my goodness. Um, besides uh, preparing regular hospitals, Egypt is building a field hospital in the Sinai, close to the border with Gaza. Will it be enough to care for the many critically wounded people being transported there? Well, it, it, once they're really transported in big numbers, because until now it's not many, the field hospital right beside uh, Rafa, not far away, has 50 beds, but they're already dispersing uh, injured. They are coming now to Cairo, to Ismailia, to other hospitals in Egypt. So that's not the problem. The problem is uh, to transport them out of Gaza. There are lists prepared by the doctors in, for example, the Shifa Hospital in Gaza, uh, coordinating with the Egyptians who can come. Of course, they're heavily injured cannot be transported, but uh, they're trying to get some kind of relief in the Gaza Strip with a uh, health sector that is more or less collapsing or on the verge of collapse. So this we will probably see more injured people coming out of the Gaza Strip in the next days. Mm. As you well know, Karim, uh, Hezbollah's uh, leader, Hassan Nasrali, is due to make his first public uh, comment since the beginning of the war. What can we expect to hear? Yeah, that is uh, a moment of uh, real tension. I just came back from Lebanon two days ago, and we could see already the trailers in television, on social media, of this speech saying, like, the promises will be fulfilled and similar things. So we're waiting what's going to happen. Uh, this speech is going to be this afternoon. There is uh, basically three possibilities. Uh, he might generally speak about the axis of resistance, which is uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, against uh, Israel, and just... Be, keep being on vague and trying to bind as many Israeli forces in the north as possible. He might determine some red lines the Israelis are not uh, to overstep, and, and then uh, Hezbollah might start a war, or he might order to press the button. So we really don't know. Until now, both forces, the Israeli side and the Hezbollah, are basically in an escalating way shooting to each other at the border, but still staying in there normal rules of engagement, which means just, that just everything very, until now just is very limited quickly, to the border area. Very, very quickly, I heard you say, for the third option, he might press the button. Did I hear you correctly? And what do you mean by that? Pressing the button means that he would uh, start a war. And, uh, of course, uh, Hezbollah has a huge missile uh, arsenal mm. and starts uh, using it. But uh, I think this is probably 
the most unlikely scenario. Ahmed al Manjhari is the World Health Organization's regional director for the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, he joined us earlier from Cairo, and I asked him whether he expects Egypt to accept further injured people for treatment. Good morning, Claire. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Yes, definitely. You know, this is based on our discussion with uh, the president, you know, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi, three weeks back when uh, Dr. Tedros and I met him. Uh, and also after that, you know, we have been arranging with the health authorities here in Egypt, as well as the Red Crescent. In fact, you know, to uh, receive uh, as, man as many as possible number of uh, patients, wounded patients and children and women for further treatment. Um, Mike Ryan, who is the deputy, the executive director of the emergency department, was here last week uh, from Geneva. And uh, we have had several meetings, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Minister of Health and Red Crescent. Uh, and he and visited where will the people there hospital. be treated? I'm curious what resources are available and which facilities in Egypt. Uh, they, have, they have prepared themselves very well. Mike Ryan visited Al Arish, Sina. Uh, hospitals there in that area. Uh, they have uh, several hospitals, in fact, prepared to receive different types of uh, casualties, patients with different types of illnesses. Uh, they have very good capacity, ambulances, uh, you know, with, with equipped with all, you know, necessary equipments and machines. Uh, Mike Ryan visited that place and he came back very positive about it. Now, um, I, uh, we've had media reports that Egypt is building a hospital for the injured uh, in Sinai. Um, can you give us any insight into how that process is going and how many people it would be able to receive? Yeah, I mean, uh, based on our discussion with them, they are preparing themselves to, re to receive currently now at this position more than 15,000 patients of different types of you know, illnesses. Uh, as you said, they have uh, established a field hospital. In addition to the current hospitals they have in Al-Ismailiya, in Al-Arish, in, in Sina, um, equipped with staff, with ambulances, with machines, drugs. Um, and uh, they, they coordinate with us, the, with Red Crescent, with other UN agencies as well. Now, I understand that you personally have also just been to Beirut, uh, meeting with officials there to discuss preparing Lebanon's health system in case hostilities do spill over into southern Lebanon. Um, at this point, how well equipped is Lebanon's health system to deal with possible casualties? Thank you for this question, Claire. In fact, as we all know, Lebanon has been, you know, undergoing a very severe political as well as economic crisis. Uh, you know, the country have been facing a very tough time when it comes into the health system. So the visit there, I met the Prime Minister, Health uh, Minister of Health and other UN agencies, and I visited uh, several locations. Um, they are trying at their level best, you know, to prepare themselves for whatever scenarios, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, their hospitals are well equipped. We distributed supplies to several hospitals. We have made training of healthcare staff, uh, you know, and, and we are trying to secure um, financial funds, you know, to support the health system. Uh, in coordination with other UN agencies, donors and partners. So it sounds like a lot of work and funds are needed uh, to be able to bring it up to enough capacity to, to deal with that possibility. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what is being done to bolster its capabilities? Um, as I have mentioned, you know, we have been coordinating with the Minister of Health for training of uh, staff, nurses, uh, we established the emergency operating centers with uh, a command by the prime minister, you know, for the whole of government sectors. Uh, we have uh, been coordinating with other UN agencies to provide supply, like, for example, with UNICEF, uh, IOM, UNHCR, uh, you know, to different hospitals. Uh, we have been strengthening the surveillance system uh, to make sure that, you know, if, if God forbid and there is a public health threat, we can identify these threats and act fast on it. Uh, we have been providing supplies like drugs, you know, trauma kits, uh, emergency kits to several hospitals in, in distributed in the country, but mainly at the areas that we expect, you know, the, the conflict is, is more there. For more, let's uh, now speak to Juliette Touma, the Director of Communications for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. She joins us now from Jordan's capital, Amman. Juliet, the uh, Commissioner General of UNRWA visited Gaza and said that he has never seen anything like it. Paint a picture of what he saw. 
Yes, uh, he did say that it was a very, very sad day for him. Um, one of the saddest in his uh, humanitarian service, and he's been doing that sort of work for nearly 30 years now. Um, he was very sad to see the people of Gaza, the Palestinian community in Gaza, so stripped of the dignity. All they were asking for was a sip of water and a piece of bread. Um, it is safe to say that we've never ever seen Gaza in such a desperate situation as we have a few days ago, as more than one million people have been forced to flee their homes, our own staff included, our own resources stretched to the, the limits, the limits of the limits. It's unprecedented. Israel says it has essentially besieged Gaza City. How many people do you estimate are still in the city, and what are they facing? The siege is across the Gaza Strip, not only Gaza City. The whole Gaza Strip from north to south is under siege, which means that very, very, very little aid and assistance is coming in, uh, and including those trucks that are a drop in the ocean that really do not correspond at all to the overwhelming needs of uh, the people. It is very, very hard for people to get out of Gaza. Um, this has come on top of a 16-year long blockade that Gaza has been going through. You're a Secretary of State. Uh, Blinken is in Israel to press for humanitarian pauses in Gaza. What is it that you require in that deal in order to provide effective help on the ground, given that UNRWA facilities have been also hit in airstrikes? UNRWA has been calling for many long weeks now for a humanitarian ceasefire. This is long overdue. We have lost 72 colleagues of ours, including most recently our colleague Mai, who is herself displaced. She also had physical disabilities and she was working with us as a software developer. She was killed with members of her family. We are calling for a humanitarian ceasefire once again. Our calls have been falling on deaf ears and we're asking how many more and how much more suffering, grief and loss? How much more? A ceasefire is very much needed for humanity. But to the extent that you can get particular and specific about this, you've also been hit. Your infrastructure has been damaged. Uh, how long does that ceasefire need to be? Imagine you get one. What do you actually need from all the forces here in order to do the work that you do? How long is the ceasefire? Forever. The ceasefire needs to last. And as for our facilities, yes, 50 of our facilities, of UN facilities, among them schools as well, but also our headquarters in Gaza City, they have been impacted during this war. And only yesterday you may have seen four schools that were sheltering around 20,000 people have been damaged because of the bombardment and because of the ongoing war. It had those UN facilities, I had UN flags on them. We share the coordinates with parties to the conflict. And there were people who were killed, including children, who were seeking shelter and safety in UN facilities. I'm curious about something. Speaking to the media, your UNRWA chief said that, quoting now, hunger is turning into anger and that civilians in Gaza have absolutely nothing. Are people already starving in Gaza? They're certainly getting hungry, sir. They're certainly getting hungry. The markets are emptying up. Uh, our own supplies are running out. Those, um, the, the trickle of aid that has been coming into Gaza since the 21st of October is by far not enough. Is by far not enough. We have been giving wheat flour to bakeries, but also the bakeries are running out of cooking gas and they're running out of fuel. This is exactly why we've been asking for urgent shipments of fuel. That is uh, Juliette Touma, the Director of Communications for UNRWA. Many, many thanks. Thank you.